session. We are very happy to have Julian Sonner from University of Geneva, who will tell us uh, uh, about quantum fuel theory and chaos. Right, so first of all, is this on? Uh, yeah, okay, very good. So um, thank you very much for the organizers for the invitation to talk about some of our work. Um, and so I'll, I'll start right now by writing an overview of what I've planned for those four lectures. So first of all, maybe an abbreviated title would have been, um, you know, recent developments in um, quantum chaos. And in fact, I want to talk about also how this relates to quantum gravity. So first of all, the good question to ask, is that also readable from the back? Is that large enough? Okay. Um, and uh, already also, uh, if I start writing too small, uh, don't hesitate to tell me, and also don't hesitate to interrupt for any other kind of questions while I'm going on. So this lecture, uh, the first one, basically will be on background material related to quantum chaos, as I assume that that's maybe material that not everyone is very familiar with. So this is something like the, the chaos boot camp. And lecture four was when we talk about the most recent stuff, which will basically be in a technical sense, the chaos bootstrap. Related also to the conformal bootstrap. In lecture two, I want to tell you um, how to think of gravity as a chaotic system. Uh, lecture, four, uh, lecture three, uh, in lecture three, I'm going to talk about a, specific, uh, a specifically important notion, which I think um, we can use to great profit, especially in the, ca in, the, in the gravity context, and that's to talk about um, ergodicity in gravity. Okay, but of course I will have to define even what I mean by this uh, ergodicity story. So um, to start off with, though, I'd like to uh, give a very general <coughs> motivation as to why um, I think it is very interesting and profitable to think about chaos um, in field theory, of course, but in particular uh, in view of these dualities that we have that Ashok already mentioned, also in gravity. So of course, let's start with an introduction. and motivation. So um, the um, very first sort of slogan I want to say is that um, quantum chaos uh, really is uh, the right way to think about, or maybe even a prerequisite, or possibly even the same thing, as the idea of quantum thermalization. So, um, how, however, so this is something that I will, of course, explain. And by the way, this is also true, maybe even more well understood in a classical context. But, Let's add to this statement the fact that um, in semi-classical gravity, quite generally, we can think of, we have been taught to think of a black hole as a thermal system. Okay, so for example, um, a precise statement can be made. Um, for example, in ADS CFT, this is something that is more generally, or that is um, appreciated to be true more generally, but we can make the precise statement in ADS CFT, for example, that, um, you know, 
uh, if we consider the gravitational setup that is dual to some field theory setup, then typically the geometric background is mapped to the state. And so that means, for example, that if I calculate the correlation function of some operator uh, or some insertion of an operator, um, where in the gravitational background I include the black hole, okay, which will have some mass, for example, or other parameters, but let's, let's just stick uh, formally with the mass. And the mass we should think of as determining um, the temperature, the inverse temperature beta. Then um, I should think this, I should think of this kind of computation um, from the dual field theory point of view. So here we are uh, on, in the gravitational setup. I should think of this as the thermal trace of the dual system where I'm in inserting the canonical density matrix E to the minus beta H where this beta is determined by the mass of the black hole. So that, that's why I was saying here the black hole just has its mass, but the mass will determine what beta I put here um, of whatever these insertions are. So, so in the field theory, this is the thermal ensemble. Okay. And so then the idea is that if these black holes, in fact, are thermal systems, um, then um, they should have an explanation uh, in terms of an underlying microscopic theory. And this microscopic theory should be, should be such that it allows us to understand, for example, how you establish ever such a thermal state or the black hole uh, in terms of the notions related to quantum thermalization and therefore to quantum chaos. So I will go into more detail regarding this, but just as a motivating example, um, this is um, rather important. And so let me write, uh, still working on the conceptual level, um, how this usually works. Okay, so what we're saying is that black hole formation Uh, as well as the process of radiation, which uh, in, in the right asymptotics will lead to evaporation. So let, let me say, and radiation perhaps evaporation is in fact a process of thermalization. Okay, and so for example, what we should do is we should think about um, um, what happens before the black hole forms. We have some, um, you know, uh, we have some um, initial configuration, which might be a, a star that has exhausted its fuel and so on. Um, but um, let's just say this is some initial state. Okay, and. Uh, we might say, okay, if this is some t is equal to zero, t is equal to, or t zero more generally, um, then we have some uh, state psi of t zero, okay? Uh, that gives us the initial condition. And from a gravitational perspective, we know quite a lot what happens. We certainly know that um, under the right conditions, this, uh, this, uh, this state will collapse in upon itself um, and it will form well, um, more or less colored horizon, if I find some trucks. Um, well, let me actually reserve the color for the singularity. Um, it will form some sort of horizon which surrounds um, the singularity. So um, black hole forms. Um, so we have something like, as time progresses, we eventually will find um, something like uh, a thermal state, so let's say, um, well, do I, yeah, did I want to be, yeah, so we want to say that uh, under time evolution psi of t eventually will be something like thermal. In order to define what I mean by thermal in these uh, inverted commas, uh, we will need to go a little bit more into the background details. Um, and that thermal state will be, you know, the end state that results from this black hole that has formed and that has radiated um, for a long time. 
Okay? And so there are, of course, some initial st uh, and, uh, intermediate states of this thermalization process, which one of the goals of this uh, lectures are we want to understand. But the point is that um, there is some time evolution u of t, t0, time evolution. And um, the supposition is that all of this is described by uh, chaotic dynamics. Okay, and so um, uh, the point is in some sense, um, first of all, that I want you to recognize this problem of black hole formation, radiation, and perhaps subsequent evaporation as an intrinsic non-equilibrium process of thermalization. So this is non-equilibrium. Non-equilibrium physics. Um, and um, secondly, that um, the, uh, the, the, the precise way of how uh, an initial state can be transformed into some uh, seemingly thermal state is one of the key questions that we've been asking for a long time about really the proper interpretation of these kind of formulae. Okay. Um, so now, um, one more remark that I want to make here is just that um, this, is a very, uh, this is a very general statement. I appreciate this. The statement being that we have thermal states, ergo, uh, the system should be chaotic. However, um, it is true that basically thermalization itself is associated to chaotic systems. As opposed to, and so whenever you make a statement, you should also say, in some sense, what will be the uh, other option. Um, so for example, um, systems that don't thermalize, um, Well, typically they will be integrable or in some sense, perhaps a little bit more interestingly, of course, they can be effectively integrable. But for example, this will be something like a strongly correlated system that is many body localized, MBL. Um, or perhaps some other exceptions to thermalization. But the generic statement is that since gravity fulfills all of the, the hallmarks of a system that thermalizes, we strongly believe um, that it should be described by chaotic dynamics. And as experience with um, generically thermalizing systems and the study of quantum chaos in such system shows, um, the insights that come from formulating things specifically in terms of the quantum cha chaotic properties um, are very powerful and lead to pretty deep insights. So, so this is basically uh, the point. And so the point that I want to make maybe to write um, one last sort of slogan before we go into um, actually uh, uh, some of the more contentful parts. So, um, well, technically contentful, I think that on a conceptual level, this, this is hopefully quite useful. So um, I want to argue that, that uh, quantum chaos can be or is a key tool. And the point is both conceptually And also, technically, let's say calculationally, um, for understanding black holes, and through the understanding of black holes, also uh, some interesting aspects of quantum gravity. 
Okay, so that's kind of the guiding thought of these lectures. So, um, well, as I was saying, um, the way that I'm, I'm planning to proceed is to now essentially give you some, some of the necessary background on chaos and in particular quantum chaos to understand the subsequent um, points that I would like to make. Um, but of course, uh, maybe this is also a good uh, place to pause for um, some questions. Okay, very good. So um, now um, let me start by um, defining um, defining some notions in chaos. So actually, notoriously, so let's say um, Lyapunov exponents, so Lyapunov um, random matrix theory, RMT, or actually maybe before I use abbreviations, I should once at least write it. So random matrix theory, which I will always abbreviate as RMT, um, and all that. So there'll be more things to say, like um, including other three-letter abbreviations that I will have to foist upon you. Um, but uh, before that, let me say that the notion of quantum chaos, like actually quantum chaos, is notoriously hard to pin down. So we will, of course, nevertheless do our best. So quantum chaos is hard to define. But classical chaos is actually rather beautifully understood. And so let me start with that, because some of those notions also carry over. In fact, despite naive expectations, they do. So um, classical. Chaos. So, um, well, the first thing that people, that comes to mind when people think about classical chaos is the famous butterfly effect. That somehow, uh, if a butterfly bats its wings here, it may uh, change drastically the weather in China or some, some such uh, uh, analogy. Um, however, that's of course true, but I want to say, say the same thing in a slightly different way which I think is more clarifying in this context. So in fact, chaotic systems, so somehow there is something about uh, dependence on, on initial conditions, right? So chaotic systems, in fact, have a dependence upon their initial conditions that makes them tend to forget about these initial conditions. So a chaotic system forgets about its uh, initial conditions. And the way that it does so, um, actually in order to say that, it's useful to adopt a phase space point of view. So if we think about phase space, so the space spanned by all the coordinates and all the momenta, um, then, um, so, say, uh, Q0, P0 at some initial time, then classical mechanics says that the Hamiltonian equations of motion act in such a way that they generate a flow of phi T that gives me, for a given initial condition Q0, P0, the state on phase space of the system at some time T. Um, so this gives basically just, okay, the notion of trajectory Q of T, P of T. And so this uh, initial dependence, uh, sorry, sensitive dependence on initial conditions that is at the heart of the butterfly effect, and in fact at the heart of this idea that chaotic systems are very good at forgetting about the initial conditions, that is um, quantified in the following sense for a chaotic system. 
Okay. If I take um, and if I if I like if if I just say that x zero, for example, is this point in phase space Q zero P zero, and then um, by analogy x of t will be this trajectory. Okay. So then if I look at x of zero here, and I look at a nearby initial condition x zero plus delta x zero here, um, then the uh, the chaotic dynamics are such that the flow, I'm running actually out of space because there should be exponential dependence, but the flow acts in such a way that the divergence of these trajectories, delta x as a function of t, should be exponential. Delta x zero times e to the lambda times t, exponential divergence for these uh, initial conditions. Maybe if we have uh, many directions we should actually think about the length, um, where lambda non-zero is the Lyapunov exponent. This is called the Lyapunov exponent. Okay. Now, right, um, so, but what does this mean? So, first of all, um, okay, I guess I'll continue on the other side. Um, maybe you want to say it in the microphone so everyone can hear. said that uh, chaotic systems forget its uh, initial conditions, but XF and X0 and X0 plus DX0 uh, make something like uh, the of exponents. Pass, uh, so the of exponents uh, is not for chaotic systems. Sorry, we'll, we'll get to what I mean by forgetting about initial conditions now. Uh, so... Uh, Zero and x uh, zero plus d x zero uh, makes some things like like uh, the upon of exponents. So the upon of exponents uh, is uh, nothing to do with uh, chaotic systems, uh, which are which uh, forget its initial uh, conditions. I'm not sure I understand actually whether you're asking a question or you're making a statement. If, the, if you're asking the question, so in a non-chaotic system, there is not supposed to be this exponential sensitivity. So there is no e to the lambda t. And if you actually define the Lyapunov exponent as, let's say, the limit of t goes to infinity of the logarithm of the linearized Hamiltonian flow, then for a system that is non-chaotic, it is supposed to be exactly zero. Now, the question about forgetting about initial conditions is going to be probably my next point. But, I mean, feel free to ask. Yes, I have a couple of questions, but tell me if you're going to explain it in, in a moment. Uh, so one is, uh, uh, is this lambda somehow constant on the phase space, or, or it really depends where we compute it? No, no, very good. So, um, so what you really should do again is what I was just uh, saying here is you should actually linearize the Hamiltonian flow around some initial condition. And then what you get is essentially a matrix that has eigenvalues, which for chaotic systems typically are non-zero and positive. And what you call D Lyapunov exponent will be the largest of those. And that will be the direction in phase space in which this, uh, the, the exponential spread of course dominates. Okay, and so perhaps this uh, answers my second question. That was, uh, uh, um, is there a reason why lambda should be positive and cannot be negative? But perhaps because it's the maximum. Well, if it's not positive, you don't have this divergence of trajectories, right? Yeah, but uh, I mean, can we have a system where lambda ah, is negative? You mean negative? systems where you, have, where you have some directions, where uh, some directions where it is at least zero? or negative? I mean, is there some reason why lambda cannot be negative? Well, I think the trajectories uh, are not allowed to cross, so I think you would probably get crossing of trajectories, right? Well, 
not if it is exponential, but I, I don't know. I can, I, I can ask you more. Yeah. Thanks. So, right, so, um, so initially closed trajectories. Um, diverge exponentially um, as a function of time. And uh, what that means is that, um, roughly speaking, um, the phase space distribution evolves towards constant density given conserved quantities. So for example, on um, constant energy shells. Okay? And uh, that's um, basically the point that you get um, uniform, let's say uniform. And such uniform uh, uh, um, phase space distributions basically um, are uh, the ones which give you the thermal properties of the system. And so thermalization basically via, well, this mixing behavior um, and this Lyapunov behavior um, lead to uh, uniform distributions. And the uniform distribution is basically uh, uh, approached no matter um, what the precise initial condition was. Okay, so the end state that this dynamics tends to is one that has uh, let's say, no imprint of the initial condition. Okay, in that sense, this butterfly effect also allows the system to forget about its initial conditions. Now, let's note one thing, um, which will be interesting in a minute, that this uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions sometimes can be written by saying that if we look at the Poisson bracket of um, Q of T with, um, for example, P of zero. This is precisely the derivative of the trajectory with respect to its initial condition. And this thing itself should also basically encode this Lyapunov exponent or the largest Lyapunov exponent, okay? And the point of having written it as a Poisson bracket is that um, this suggests actually um, that we use Dirac's idea about how to go from um, uh, Hamiltonian dynamics to quantum mechanics, and we think of something like I over H bar times the commutator of the operator Q of T, P of zero. Okay, and the question is whether this defines some kind of quantum version of the Lyapunov exponent, and also whether that will be a useful notion um, to take um, these classically chaotic systems into the quantum realm. Okay, so we will have some more to say about this, but um, the actual, so, so is this something like a quantum version of a Lyapunov exponent? And if so, is that a particularly useful way of thinking about quantum chaotic systems? So, however, with this um, semi-classical bridge, let me now go and try and describe what actually is the good notion of quantum chaos that we want to employ. So one obvious point is actually that um, quantum mechanics, we shouldn't really think about trajectories. I mean, that is one of the first things we learn um, in quantum mechanics. And moreover, uh, thinking about quantum mechanics 
uh, in a phase-space phase space way is maybe not the most convenient way of thinking about quantum mechanics. So, however, so let's say um, no good notion of what is a trajectory. No good notion of trajectory. Um, and there are many other reasons why you, know, you might not want to um, really use it. However, there is one way um, to make this notion a little bit more precise. So before I go to what is a more sort of intrinsic, let's say, intrinsic quantum way of thinking about chaos, let me nevertheless mention this. So um, you can define um, something like uh, the idea that a um, commutator defines, uh, so a commutator related to the Poisson bracket, which the Poisson bracket encodes the sensitive dependence on initial conditions, you can define uh, a notion in quantum mechanics related to this, and that's by asking what is the expectation value of this commutator however squared and with respect to a particular state in which, so most of the time, people will choose here the thermal state. And this thing does have a notion of, um, so comes with a one over h bar squared, which is again uh, an indication that we're actually talking about semi-classics, not really, um, you know, hard quantum regime, e to the two, la the quantum Lyapunov exponent times t. And in fact, um, the way that people think about this nowadays is in terms of the so-called out-of-time order correlation function, or OTOC, because um, there are two things that one realizes one can do, or should perhaps even do. One is that once you think about the commutator of these two operators, actually there's no reason why you should think of Q and P. You can just think of two arbitrary operators, A and B, for example, and moreover, you can say that the interesting part, the one that gives you the exponential divergence here, actually comes from the part of this, it's a square of a commutator of two operators, so it's a four-point function. It comes from um, the contribution that is of the kind, so in this case it would be Q of T, P, Q of T, P, but you can write it, as I said, for more general operators, B. Okay, so more generally, We um, talk about the um, out of time order correlator and out of time order because you know time doesn't uh, strictly increase as you read this expectation really from right to left. Okay. Now this is uh, very nice. It's a very nice object, and in fact, um, Maldasena, Schenker, and Stanford showed that um, in semi-classical systems you can bound this. You can actually show that this. The Apunov exponent is upper bounded by 2 pi over beta, where beta is the inverse temperature that you use here in this expectation value. But I do want to say that it is really a semi-classical notion. It is really a semi-classical notion, um, and in that sense, um, well, okay, as such, the words that people also use is it has to do with, um, you know, the scrambling or more um, previously people will, will call something like this the Ehrenfest time. And so it, it actually has to do very much with um, uh, thinking about uh, a quantum system semi-classically and porting a classical idea of chaos into the semi-classical regime of um, a quantum system. And I would say that um, it's still, uh, it is still really, the jury is still out whether thinking about this kind of imprint of classical chaos in quantum mechanics is a right, correct, or robust way of defining um, quantum chaos. So instead, what people usually like to do is they like to think about chaos in quantum systems 
in ways that are much more intrinsic to uh, quantum systems themselves. There's a question up there. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that in classical chaos, there's no analogous bounds on the Lyapunov exponent. Is that right? And uh, so, and if so, that makes it a little confusing for me to understand the precise sense in which this is a semi-classical like statement, because it's not like it then limits to the classical Lyapunov exponent in some limit. Is that right? Well, the the way that I want to say this is a semi-classical notion is that um, in all the contexts that are well understood, you have to have some semi-classical parameter, which I'm calling one over h bar squared in front here. So it can also be some effective semi-classical parameter like large n, or more generally large central charge, or maybe we can think about large entropy density or something like this. But there has to be uh, uh, one of these semi-classical parameters. So that's the reason for my uh, statement that it's really a semi-classical notion. However, um, what you say, of course, is correct. And uh, this bound, I, I think this bound is a very deep statement about, about quantum chaos. I, so I would agree with that, yeah. But um, yeah, anyway, that's maybe a discussion to be had. In, yeah. Right, so. Yeah. In the, in, the, in the lambda less than beta, is there any h bar there that you have put to one? Yeah, I think um, there is a, um, Yes, presumably, because we want to think of this, uh, the units of time, to be uh, uh, in terms of, let's say, the RN plus time. Yeah. All right, so now um, let me see how I'm doing for time. Expectedly bad. So um, let's say um, an alternative idea, which is actually older than this, is to think in instead to work directly with the spectrum of the system. So let's say the system is described by some Hamiltonian H. Of course, there's nothing more in intrinsic than all the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, uh, of the quantum system that you're looking at. Now, all the development that um, leads to this point of view follows from an observation. And this observation is due to Wigner. So this observation is that um, a, the, what defines a chaotic Hamiltonian, um, and I'm going to draw a figure here, is that I can think of its, its uh, uh, microstate spectrum as being, in the appropriate sense, well described by a um, random matrix theory. Okay, so for this we need to understand in what sense this, this is supposed to be true. So, um, so but again, to, to be clear, what the statement here is that you take your favorite quantum system, in our case, of course, it should be some gravitational system, but of course many other uh, um, interesting systems have been uh, looked at under this 
a microscope of quantum chaos. So you have one Hamiltonian, but in some sense, um, its uh, quantum spectrum is well described by drawing the Hamiltonian from a uh, appropriate distribution of randomly chosen matrices and averaging. Okay, so the observation by Wigner um, is about the following quantity. So let's think about um, the let's think about the distribution of energy levels. So, for example, um, you take something that um, people like to call P of S where S is actually the difference in energy levels. So S will be omega, and it's usually normalized in um, units of delta. I think people like to put a pi here. So delta, delta we need to say is the average spacing between levels. Okay, so in other words, you ask about the differences between adjacent energy levels uh, across the entire system, and the average of that is what you call delta. And then a nice way of asking about distribution of spacings is to ask about differences of energy. So E1 minus E2 will be omega um, divided by delta. Okay? And what you can do is you can go through the entire spectrum of your system, and you can ask um, how many times do I find two adjacent levels that have for example, S, so, you know, if S is 1, then we're at approximately 1 pi of the average uh, spacing. You can ask um, how many of them are there in which the subsequent level spacing is much, much less than 1. And, you know, you give yourself some kind of width of, of S and you bin them in here. And in this way, you start making some histogram, which, uh, okay, I'm just sort of inventing here, but... Uh, it will look like something like this, um, and it will be peaked at one. Now the statement about this, uh, the, the statement by Wigner, and that was of course elaborated upon by many other people, Dyson, uh, Meta in particular, is that this histogram is um, well described by um, uh, a, a probability distribution, P of S, uh, which people like to call Wigner's surmise because he essentially guessed it. Okay. Um, but that follows by um, choosing an H from a probability distribution P of H um, yeah, and, 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 and uh, calculate P of S. So P of S, one could say, uh, maybe one way of saying it is P of omega is something like, you know, you ask uh, E energy level minus E energy level plus one, and you want this to be omega, weigh it by uh, the correct measure on all the energy eigenvalues, okay, and average it over the spectrum. Now, um, this P of H, so the probability distribution for your matrix, is what defines this measure, okay? So the statement was um, by, by Wigner and subsequently, as I said, by many other people, that an, an actual uh, chaotic Hamiltonian, one Hamiltonian, will produce such a histogram. Um, this histogram will basically be given by, uh, instead of having an individual Hamiltonian, drawing your Hamiltonian at random and calculating the corresponding quantity, namely the level spacing distribution of subsequent levels, um, um, with respect to this probability distribution, okay? And the point is that a quantum chaotic system is supposed to be one whose level spacing statistics, so, um, or level statistics, is given by random matrix theory. And this is sort of some intrinsic quantum mechanical definition of what a quantum mechanically chaotic system is or should be. Now, um, 
of course, I'm, I'm just giving you a glimpse. Uh, so already here, I've given you the level spacing statistics. I'm saying level statistics because there are other statistical properties of the spectrum that one can define and calculate and compare. Um, and of course, also, um, many interesting things can and should be said about what this probability distribution is. And in fact, um, again, time permitting, um, we, we will discuss some of those things, but I want to discuss them on the, uh, uh, on the actual examples that I would like to actually uh, treat, rather than um, you know, going into like some category, categorization right now in a very systematic way. But okay, basically the, the one thing I should still say is that the original distributions that Wigner and Dyson proposed were basically distributions where you sample from a Gaussian distribution for the matrix H, which is only uh, restricted by the fact that the matrix should be Hermitian because we are in quantum mechanics and maybe should respect something like time reversal invariance or not as the case may be. Oh, omega, um, omega will be something like EI, uh, so the nearest, nearest uh, neighbor level spacing, but that's a good point. Let me just write it here. Nearest neighbor spacing. And the nearest neighbor spacing um, in, well, I've written it here in units of delta, but omega is just the nearest neighbor spacing. Are, are we considering only quantum system with discrete spectrum or we can consider also continuum spectrum? Yes, so that's a very good question. So in principle, um, this really only makes sense for systems that have a discrete spectrum, right? But what you would typically do is, for example, if you have, uh, so, so, but here we, we're going into territory where things are technically maybe not so well under control at this point. But for example, you might ask what happens in a quantum field theory. So if you put this quantum field theory on a finite manifold and you restrict, for example, the energy to be some kind of microcanonical energy E average, then you still expect that in this microcanonical Hilbert space, you will have effectively a discrete spectrum and you can describe it by, uh, by, by, by these notions. But of course, if the spectrum is continuous, if you just think about the full spectrum um, and include all the continuous parts, for the continuous part, uh, this makes no sense. While your previous definition makes sense also for, for, uh, for continuous spectrum, right? Um, there is nothing intrinsically uh, that I would say here needs to be restricted to a, uh, a continuous spectrum. So the, the first definition seems to be a bit more general. Well, but it has the drawback, as I said before, that it is a semi-classical notion. Mm. Okay. So, very good. So, um, wait, wait, there's another question. Uh, the double scaling limit of the random matrix model is related to a phase transition in the quantum chaotic model. Say again, please. Yeah, the double scaling limit ah. of the random matrix model is related to a gravity thing or is related to a, a phase transition of the quantum chaotic model? Um, we will talk about these notions for, for uh, matrix models where we take the double scaling limit. Um, so. I think, yeah, maybe we can postpone the discussion, yeah. All right, so, um, good.
so okay, so so maybe I can still say that. So in that sense, um, um, we should think of. the quantum chaos in terms of looking at the level spacing statistics of these systems. And perhaps um, we should do this in a way that is, let's like, say, microcanonical Hilbert space by microcanonical Hilbert space, or actually, um, as I will um, argue uh, in my last lecture, also in such a way, for example, that takes account of um, local symmetry structures of uh, more non-trivial systems that are not just quantum mechanics with a finite number of states, but uh, we will see that, okay? Now, um, there is also another uh, notion here um, that will be very interesting for quantum chaos, and this is um, probably what I will finish on today, but let me just write it here. Um, so, so far, I guess we've only talked about energy levels, but there's of course more to, to life than energy levels. And so for example, if you want to talk about operators and if you want to talk about the um, expectation values and the time evolution of operators, then um, we need to add a bit more structure. And the thing that I want to introduce um, is this idea of um, um, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Now, um, before I go there, though, um, what I want to do is I want to, well, I want to say one more thing, just one more sort of uh, general background. There is a very interesting conjecture. There is a conjecture by Bohigas Giannoni and Schmidt, which people also like to call, the, of course, the VGS conjecture. We seem to like three-letter acronyms. Um, and what they're saying is that the, um, the level statistics or the spectra of classically chaotic systems If quantized, so if you quantize such a classically chaotic system, once quantized, well, this is not, not a very good sentence because, of course, once you've got a spectrum, you've already quantized, but you know what I mean. Um, so classically chaotic systems, once quantized, uh, their spectra follow RMT statistics. Okay, so this is supposed to be true. And of course, uh, even saying it like this, I think invites uh, uh, comments about um, ultimately in those systems, when you have class if you have quantum systems that have a good classical limit, then um, there ought to be some connection between these classical notions and maybe then semi-classical notions of chaos and these hard quantum notions of chaos that I was arguing for. So it's so when I, so I you know I try to maybe make not such absolute statements because um, much of this is not known, but it's it's true that maybe these notions are not so different after all. Maybe one actually implies the other, but if that is the case, then we are certainly talking about systems which have a good classical limit. So quantum systems which have a good classical limit, and in the context of such systems, as I said, this is the subject of a conjecture for which there is plenty of evidence. Um, and is known in the field as the BGS conjecture. Now, um, right, let me see how I'm going to... Um, I, yeah. Right, I think what, so, um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you uh, an argument which certainly does not come to rise not to the level of proof of this, um, but which um, gives you 
uh, some insight as to how this could be true. And in particular, it will introduce a technique that I want to make use of uh, uh, in later lectures uh, called the chaotic supersymmetric sigma model. But because that is a somewhat more technical development, instead of squeezing it in now, um, I think I'm going to skip that part and um, start it at the beginning of the next lecture. So I want to then, I do want to directly make some comments about this ETH um, and so postpone this, uh, this development to the beginning of the next lecture. I can go on until three. I, I know, I know, but even so, oh, I, I, yes, maybe I'll start it and then um, we'll continue this discussion. Yes, yes, no, the, the reason is that even so, I'm worried that I'm going to squeeze it too much. But let me, let me actually start it. It's right, let's, let's just do it. Let's do it. So, um, oh, okay, so uh, one thing that um, I want to say, two things I want to say. One, a slightly more technical point, um, is about the behavior of this distribution near the origin. So what this is telling us is that two energy eigenvalues really don't like to be very close to each other, okay? So, because they don't want to be very close to each other, there is actually also a way of understanding this in terms of a force between two eigenvalues. As you approach them, they really want to resist that. And so this, this tail end near the origin um, is a sign of what people like to call level repulsion. Okay, so these chaotic systems show level repulsion. Okay, uh, let's say P of S or P of omega tends to zero as S tends to zero. Secondly, though, from this also, uh, again, whenever you say, you, can't read them, uh, you cannot read this particular part? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Oh, because it's too small or because it's too low down? It's meant to say level repulsion, but I will write bigger in future. So, um, <laughs> well, you know, we want Sakura to know what I said. So uh, the other thing is that uh, for a system that is actually integrable, so that doesn't thermalize, that is not chaotic, this uh, level spacing distribution near the origin behaves uh, very different. In fact, this, this turns out to be, so this is the integrable, this is the integrable part. Okay? And in particular, um, it has a finite probability of having levels that are very close to each other. Okay? including allowing for degener degenerate levels. Whereas for this uh, chaotic case, once you have uh, gotten rid of all of the symmetries which might force degeneracies, so in the absence of those symmetries, um, the probability density that you find uh, coincident levels is uh, strictly zero. Okay, so, um, very good. So, um, oh, uh, <laughs> And the third point was that there is a great deal of universality here. Um, I have enough space to write it big enough here, okay? There's a great deal of universality here in the sense that um, once we have uh, uh, specified the symmetries of the system, then the quantum chaotic systems universally show these kind of curves appropriate to their symmetry class of their level spacing statistics. So there is a great deal of universality here, and this universality is going to be sort of a key uh, point about what I'm talking about next. So what I want to give you is, I want to give you an argument for this behavior from symmetry breaking.
So I'm, I'm only going to give you a sketch of this. And maybe um, as time goes on, we will be able to fill, fill in more details. But again, as pertains to the kind of applications that I have in mind. So um, let's focus on something that is very similar to this uh, sort of thing that we talked about uh, here, but subtly not the same. So we, we'll actually talk about the correlation um, of two energy eigenvalues, but not necessarily adjacent ones. So let's focus on something like rho of E1, rho of E2, um, where I will already ominously put some bar over here that will uh, imply some, some form of averaging. Um, and this is just the two-level correlation, okay? And rho of E is the spectral density, which is the trace over the whole Hilbert space of delta of E minus H. Okay, this is the spectral density. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm focusing on the two-level correlation because this is the first non-trivial example where the kind of argument that I'm about to make can be made. Um, but of course, uh, as I was saying already here, statistics, you could also think about higher moments, much higher moments, and perhaps other uh, sort of, uh, let's say, um, mm, uh, contentful probes of the spectrum of the system. But this is one that gives rise to a nice story. However, instead of directly focusing on these things, let me focus, a, focus on something that is like a generating function of this. So this generating function, I will call it Z. Um, and of course, I can write these quantities unaveraged first. And when I need to average them in the appropriate sense, we will discuss these bars. So Z, I will want to think of as a determinant of E1 minus H times a determinant of E2 minus H uh, divided by two further determinants, which, uh, okay, I'm, I'm just going to call it E3 minus H and the determinant of E4 minus H, okay? Um, I could continue adding ratios of determinants if I were interested in higher moments of these rows. Um, for the time being, as I said, let's focus on that. And for um, regions that uh, are related to convergence of certain integrals, as well as uh, certain more technical arguments about contours, um, I put a positive imaginary value on one of these and a negative imaginary value on this energy. So these are four energies which label my function Z. Those energies will eventually descend to the energy insertions in these spectra, so, so those are the same um, objects. But um, here I need to be careful about the analytic structure. And moreover, uh, typically speaking in this generating functional, I, or generating function, I will have twice as many energy arguments as I have in my spectral probe. And uh, well, they will be set after certain manipulations to be equal pairwise. And so I end up having the right number of energy insertions. So now um, the whole story follows because, um, because of a very simple trick. Uh, So just by exploiting the properties of Gaussian integrals. So exploiting the properties of Gaussian integrals, I can write these uh, determinants as exponentials. So there's the simple rewriting. Well, whenever I say something like simple uh, in a paper or lecture notes, I sort of kick myself because what's simple, of course, depends on 
<laughs> on your taste. But um, this one is really just using uh, um, Gaussian integrals. And I can write such determinants. I can, I can actually write an exponential for each determinant, but I can unify that. I can write something like psi bar. Um, and then, um, let me see what notation I chose. Um, well, first of all, I put an i up front. And then E, I call this hat, minus H. And let me put a 4 here, psi. Where psi um, is a, a vector which has four times the dimension of the Hilbert space. So it is actually a vector that has, well, let me call the dimension of the Hilbert space D, so it has two D directions which are bosonic because bosonic Gaussian integrals will give me one over the determinant of the, uh, of the uh, operator sandwiched between them. And it has two D fermionic directions for the determinants in the numerator. So psi psi bar is a 2D slash 2D graded uh, vector. So there are Grassmann directions. Oh, this is now too small for Sakura again. Um, sorry. And there are um, bosonic directions. So just C numbers. Okay. So now this simple rewriting um, basically so far uh, is, is really just a rewriting. So, um, however, then the idea is that okay, um, so I'm going to just refer to this, to this before I completely rub it away. So we're going to do, we're going to now consider Z with some uh, appropriate uh, averaging. So now, this um, is a, um, in practice, very subtle point. What I mean by this is that, uh, for example, even to make this definition here for one single quantum system, the fact that we have defined some finite bin size, okay, this is in effect some averaging because you average about over a number of nearby states. There are also other notions of averaging that can be used. So for example, I could even think about writing down this same quantity when I directly sample H from a random matrix distribution. Then what the averaging is is very clear. Um, maybe, um, so I'm not going to be able to, to push this through technically now, but just to say maybe if that is also useful for some people also in some of the question se 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 sessions, we can do these developments um, more explicitly in cases where the steps are mathematically, uh, well, not too involved. And one of these examples is when you actually sample from a random matrix distribution, okay? But what I really have in, in mind is more like um, uh, you take an individual system and you do some sort of averaging on the same spirit that you do here, okay? So now, um, so what we want to consider now is we want to consider this generating functional of spectral correlations um, under this averaging. So then eventually, eventually, um, what we're going to do is um, one, one is able to rewrite Z with this average, averaging procedure as a nonlinear uh, supersymmetric sigma model. Okay. Uh, the supersymmetry is basically the one that we introduced here uh, as an auxiliary technique in order to exponentiate a quotient of determinants. 
Um, the fact that it becomes a nonlinear sigma model is related to uh, the idea that I only mentioned so far in the, uh, in, the, in the title is that there will be some symmetry breaking. And the symmetry breaking, uh, uh, um, the right description of the physics around the symmetry breaking point is in terms of a nonlinear signal model. So um, basically, this nonlinear sigma model, it follows from first rewriting this thing as an integral over a matrix which I like to call A, which has um, a, an, an, an action which is minus D, remember this was the Hilbert space dimension, times some gamma of A, um, uh, plus a super trace of um, x times a. So now, um, what is a? So a is basically, you should think of a as the following field. So a is a 4 by 4, in this case, because I have four energy arguments. A is a 4 by 4 graded matrix. In fact, you should think of A, if I call its free indices A, B, it's something like these psi, psi bars, A, B, where I'm contracting over the indices mu. What does that mean? Um, you see, as I said, these psi's were had twice the dimension of the Hilbert space bosonic directions and twice the dimension of the Hilbert space fermionic directions. The Hilbert space directions I am calling mu here, and I'm summing over them. The only indices that I'm leaving open are the indices that tell me, if you want, which determinant I'm referring to. So A is equal to 1 will be this determinant. B is equal to 1. A is equal to 2 will be this determinant. So these are some sort of flavor indices, if you want. I have four flavors of fermions. Each flavor labels one of these determinants. And then I have the colors which label where on the Hilbert space I am, and those are the indices mu, and I'm contracting over them. That leaves me a four by four graded matrix. This is the matrix I call A. And I introduce this matrix A by, as a hubbard stratonovich field for psi psi bar that will um, feature here after this averaging procedure. So that's what A is. Then um, gamma of A, is the potential, which we need to write as a super trace of some potential function V of A. So super trace because I have now a graded theory. Again, this was a, a technical trick that I, uh, that I involved, that I um, have here. Okay, I'll just be able to write down the, the final answer, so to speak, and then I will take up, as I said, the, the more explan explanatory part um, at the beginning of next lecture. So is a is a graded matrix, and it's okay. We can we can be explicit. It's a sorry two slash two graded matrix. Um, and X is a diagonal matrix in this flavor space. So this four dimensional graded flavor space, which just takes E. Uh, sorry, I should actually write it as E three, E four because those were the bosonic directions, and I had E one, E two with the fermionic directions. This is a uh, graded diagonal matrix. And it, um, it encodes the dependence on energy that I had right from the beginning and I need to carry through. And these energies uh, appear here as sources for the field A. Um, and finally, maybe, okay, no, I should, I should still say, hmm. How to say that big enough for uh, <laughs> So this is um, averaging procedure. OK. And uh, OK, more about this uh, uh, soon. And finally, um, gamma of A, OK, an example for gamma of A, for example, it would be just a quadratic potential. Or it would, could be, for example, a cubic 
and other things can be imagined, and actually other things will uh, appear as we go on. Um, but before I finish, let me just say that this is not yet the nonlinear sigma model. The nonlinear sigma model follows very generically from this structure because um, one will argue that this system here shows a certain symmetry breaking pattern. And once you have that symmetry breaking pattern, it doesn't matter very much what the precise potential is because the theory that follows is dictated by the symmetry breaking pattern and not necessarily by the microscopic structures that I would have written down. But I think um, I've gone already one minute over the extra time, so let me pause here for questions and we'll take, uh, take up the rest next time. Sorry, I have not understood why you divided by these two other determinants, uh, which yeah. was the origin of the supersymmetric. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Um, that is easy to answer by writing the equation. So let us, let us consider the determinant of E minus H, and let us already divide by, uh, in fact, the determinant E2 minus H. Okay, now what I want. is rho of E. Now, what I know is that trace of 1 mi over E minus H has a real part, plus or minus, or whatever, minus plus I pi, if I put a plus or minus here, times delta of E. So now, if I put the trace over this, then the part that is trace delta of E will give me my spectral density, okay? Now, how do I get trace of one over E plus or minus minus H? It's by taking a derivative D E2 of this ratio. Let me call this ratio, uh, uh, let me call it D. I'm not calling it R because people like to call this, this is a resolvent, they like to call this R. So let me call this e D, even though it's a ratio. So if I take D of E2 of E1, E2, um, then what I get is I get determinant of E1 minus H divided by determinant of E2 minus H times trace of 1 of E2 minus H, okay? And what that means is that if I now actually put E1 is equal to E2, then I can forget about this determinant factor. And if I had not done that, I would have not just ended up with the trace of the spectral resolvent. So it's a normalization trick if you want. So at the end you will put E1 equal to E3 and E2 equal to E4, right? Or, or actually in the opposite way, and okay. the fact that you can do it in two different ways has some very nice technical consequences. Thank you. Thanks, I should, have, I should have actually said that anyway. Okay, unless there is some very urgent question, I propose that we postpone the questions to the discussion sessions, which will be in half an hour. Is there any like very urgent question? Okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> I don't know about very urgent, but perhaps a very naive question. Uh, so uh, when you take the average of Z, uh, presumably uh, it's an average uh, over uh, many Hamiltonians, uh, right? And uh, there would be uh, presumably, I mean, for some uh, large n matrix, uh, there would be many components to integrate over. But uh, in this expression, you are integrating over a matrix, which is a four by four matrix. Uh, it seems a little counterintuitive that you can get uh, some average of this partition function by integrating over just a four by four matrix. Well, um, so, so there is something here which I think we're getting ahead of ourselves, but let me, let me answer the following question. Let me, let me tell you the following point. If the original system that we put in here is actually a fully random matrix. So this will be a D by D random matrix, a huge random matrix. Mm -hmm. My statement is still that I can write for you a theory where I only integrate over a four by four matrix and it will be mathematically exactly giving rise to the same uh, spectral correlations. 
So you can reduce a D by D matrix for sure to a four by four matrix. Now I think there is a different sense to your question, but that maybe we'll discuss some other time. Okay, thanks. Okay, let us thank Julian again. Okay, so we will resume in uh, at uh, three thirty with a discussion session where you can ask uh, informally uh, uh, questions to our lecturers uh, from today. And now we will have a coffee, which I think will happen just.